Our next speaker will always remind me of one of Silicon Brighton's biggest achievements to date. After our AI and machine learning event last year, we were approached by an R developer who, alongside three colleagues, wanted to start an R meetup. With the Silicon Brighton network, we were able to find the meetup space, refreshment sponsorship, attendees, and wrap around a little promotion. 62 people attended, and it was one of the most vibrant technical meetups I've been to in years. Jeremy Horn from Rocket Mill, and now organizer at Brighton R, was one of those four. He will explain today the power of machine learning and R in segmenting CRM databases. An essential watch for any marketeers with large CRMs they're keen to unlock further value from. Hello everyone, I'm Jeremy Horn, and I'm here to talk to you about the power of machine learning and R in segmenting CRM databases. Now this is a little bit of an odd talk for me. Usually, for those of you that have seen me speak in the past, I'm used to having a stage where I can move around and generally not stay in the same place for more than about two seconds. Today, I'm recording from a disused bedroom in my house. I have really high-tech recording equipment, such as the cardboard box that my laptop is resting on and the notepad that my mouse is resting on. Um, I am also standing up, as you can notice, so I'm not constricted by sitting down at a desk. At least I can move my hands if I can't move my body. What I want to talk to you about today is two subjects that are very close to my heart. Machine learning and R. So machine learning, which I've been doing since before machines were learning, back in 2005, when perhaps it wasn't as big a thing as it obviously is now. Also R, so I'm an advocate, lover, whatever you want to call it, of the R programming environment. Again, I've been coding since 2005, but picked up a lot further in 2010 as R became bigger and bigger and bigger. And normally, because these events are held in a networking scenario and I can come and talk to you all afterwards, you can come and talk to me, I'd be able to tell you a little bit more about myself then. As we're not going to be able to do that today, I thought I'd give you my life. But rather than tell it to you in words and boring phrases, I'm giving you my life in logos. So I'm the head of data science at Rocket Mill, and we'll talk a little bit about Rocket Mill very, very shortly. I'm also the co-founder and co-organizer of Brighton R, Brighton's premier, or only, uh, R user group, uh, powered and supported by the wonderful people at Silicon Brighton who have brought this event to you today. We had our first event really, really successful with 60 plus attendees in January. We were going to have another event at the beginning of April and then this all happened, hence why I'm standing here today in my disused bedroom, as I said to you uh, a short while ago. But we will be back and we'll be back and bigger and better than ever. Uh, you might have worked out I love R. I don't know if I've said that yet, but I do really, really love R. And you're probably beginning to think that I'm a little bit of a geek, so I should probably tell you that I do have other interests, interests that I partake in outside of the working world. I'm a massive fan, in fact a season ticket holder of 20 years at Middlesex County Cricket Club. I've been through all the highs, very few of them, all the lows, lots and lots of them. In fact, having been a member for 20 years, I was promised last year I was going to get a special commemorative badge in the post. So guys at Middlesex, if you're watching, and I know you're big lovers of R, so you'll be on you'll be on the online now. If you are watching, please, 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 you'll make somebody very happy in their isolation if you can send that badge across to me. I'm also an avid gambler, and I'm a very bad avid gambler, because as you can see, I'm standing here in this bedroom, as I've mentioned, and not having my isolation on a nice hot Caribbean island somewhere. But I do use R to help me build out. Okay, let, let's not talk about R anymore. Let, let, let's stop. Um, and I'm also a big lover of beer. That's proper beer, you know, real ale, not Foster's or anything like that. I'm a member of the campaign for real ale. I work out what beers are best using an algorithm. In no, no, let's 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 not talk about R. But R is really important to me, and it's important in more ways than just one. R is a big part of my family and a big part of my household. Indeed, my three-year-old is already learning to code within R. Here he is in front of the console right now. Uh, I started teaching him just before his second birthday. It's really important. Kids of the future, they need to learn how to code. 
But you've got to be careful. If any of you out there, and I'm sure there are plenty of you watching, that want to teach your three-year-old how to code in R, be careful. So I've taught him all of the keyboard shortcuts within our studio. I can't expect him to type commands, but if I say press this button and this button and something happens, that's quite exciting. For those of you avid R users that are watching, you'll know that control on L is quite dangerous in our studio. Um, for those of you that don't use our studio, uh, that clears the console. It clears all the code that you've executed recently. And the other day when I was in the middle of working in our studio, he came in to show me his new tricks, press the two buttons on the keyboard, and I had no idea what I'd just run. So teach your kids, but teach them carefully and responsibly for those of you that are homeschooling at the moment. A couple of shout outs before I go into my talk, obviously to the guys at Silicon Brighton who have put this on today and sponsor our, our meetup group. For those of you that aren't part of it and want to be, please go to the link that you can see on screen in front of you now. Join our meetup page. We will be back. We will be bigger. We'll be better than ever. We had 60 plus people in January. We want to get even more than that when we can have a face to face meetup again. And we're a really inclusive, friendly bunch and we'd love to see you at our next meetup. Just to talk a little bit about Rocket Mill as well, so I realise there'll be some people that are watching today that don't know very much about what we do. We are an independent, full-service digital marketing agency, and yes, I know you're saying it, we've tried to put as many buzzwords as we can on one slide. In a nutshell, we plan, buy and execute media campaigns for our clients. So we'll plan a campaign up front, we'll produce the beautiful videos and pictures that you see online when that campaign goes live, and then of course I come in at the end analysing the campaign, telling people what's worked really well, what they could do better next time, and doing some amazing data science wizardry to tell them even more exciting things about how their campaigns performed. We're slightly different to traditional agencies and traditional businesses, so we put people first. Now that means treating your, as a client, that means treating your customer as our most important client. From a business perspective, that means that we create a fantastic culture inside the office and inside the company so that people can be inspired to do great work. By inspiring people to do amazing work, that will fuel growth for our clients, and that means that they'll want us to get involved in even more pieces of work and even more projects with them and grow us as a business as well. And cultures like that naturally win lots and lots of awards. We've been recognised by a lot of the top media bodies such as the Campaign and Drum and Google, but also by places such as the Sunday Times in their best places to work list. And as if I didn't need any more cementing that my decision was the correct one when I joined last year, two weeks after joining we were named as Brighton Company of the Year. So that's incredibly exciting to have that accolade against our name as well. And we work with clients that are household names, so Kimberly Clark there in the top right hand corner, very close to my heart. Having a three year old at home, I use a lot of their childcare brands. In fact, when I said at the beginning that my laptop was resting on a cardboard box, it's actually resting on a box of baby wipes. Other clients that you can see, the Gym Group, One Family, local in Brighton, um, and lo lots, lots more that aren't even on this collection on this slide as well. But to the challenge, to why we're here today, what have you all come to see my talk for? And really it's an appeal out there to people that have CRMs, particularly to marketers. So if you think about CRMs, as marketers we all have one. They house data on our customers. They might come in various different shapes, sizes, be housed within different technologies, some might be a bit more advanced than others, but we all have a CRM, we all have customers within our CRM. And we'll have customers that have purchased with us very, very recently, but we'll have some customers that we haven't seen for years and years and years. If we wanted to conduct some kind of media strategy or targeting strategy on our customers, it's very inefficient to contact all of the customers all of the time. And so as marketers, we need to identify who are the most important people, who is going or most likely to do something with us in the near future and should be getting our attention as a brand now. And we might start by approaching this using a simple or a standard segmentation algorithm, something such as RFV, recency frequency value. Now this is usually the point when I'm on stage where I would get up and do the whole weatherman or teacher kind of thing and point to various different things on the screen to be able to explain them to you. Again, not really very easy today. I can point at my screen, but you're probably not going to know what I'm talking about. So let me try and talk you through what's in front of you here. 
starting with the color coded table on the top left of this slide and you can see it's got greens and yellows and oranges and reds it's kind of rainbowy as a table if you like but what does it mean well if you have a look along the top from left to right you've got the r metric recency and at the far right you've got people that have purchased very very recently so that could be within say the past month at the far left of this table you've got people that have purchased least frequently at least recently that might be three four five etc years ago now running from top to bottom you've got the f metric which is frequency so if i start at the bottom where you've got that big red square in the where it says low that is somebody or that is the people on the database those are the people that have purchased least frequently possibly only once ever going up to the top corner the top left hand corner you've got the people that have purchased most frequently that might be 20 30 40 etc plus times the bit that's in the middle is the value and here it's expressed monetarily you could express it in numbers of customers you could express it in percentages but it's to give you an idea of the value of the individuals that sit within those cells and it's all powered by the table that you see below this beautiful rainbow color coded table and that's the one with a customer id on the left hand side then your recency frequency value metrics and then you have a score so the score is literally saying 100 is the most recent the most frequent the highest value that you can get and that's what you see in the top line in the bottom line of that table where it says 10 that's the least recent least frequent least value that you can get on the database and using those scores or using the recency frequency value metrics you can put these customers into a segment so you can see customer id 123 in the top line they're in what we call the hhh high 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 segment high recency high frequency high value whereas customer 890 in the bottom line they're in the lll low 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 segment low recency low frequency low value and because these are three different dimensions in which you're classifying your customers you can put them onto a three-dimensional plot much like you see on the right hand side here but as marketers these recency frequency value models are great but there is one limitation and quite often you'll see that databases are skewed towards the low recency low frequency blocks as you can see in the example here almost 40 percent of your database is highlighted in those bottom two red blocks whereas if you have a look at the top blocks none of them are breaking one percent and so as marketers your challenge is how do i move people from the bottom blocks up to the top blocks how do i get them to engage with my brand again and it is really really difficult perhaps the place that most marketers start is by looking at traditional geo demographics so that might be things like experience mosaic or acorn or some kind of postcode mapping tool now the way these work and this is using experience as an example it takes customer postcodes and it maps them and tells you a lot more rich information about what that postcode is like so what type of houses are there there what size of families do people own their homes what's their average income what's their media consumption and so in this example here you can see remembering that if you look at the index which is a column and um, just before you can see the blue bars and the blue bars represent that index thinking about 100 as kind of average you can see here that c is very well above 250 getting close to 300 so our customers here are most likely to sit in mosaic c so that will tell us a lot about what these people are like and again i've got some definitions on the right hand side all the way down to the bottom where you've got the j's and k's which is where our customers are least likely to be so this is great as a marketer you think well all i need to do is run a mosaic or run a, an experience an acre whatever it is run that for the customers in the top block run it for the customers in the lower block and i want to get more people like the people that i can see in the top block the problem with doing that is often you get something like this so i've got my lowest rfe block on the left i've got my highest rfe blocks on the right and if I give you a second or two to look at them, you'll start to see that the two sets of profiles look very similar. You've got B's and C's at the top with very similar indices. You've got I's and K's at the bottom, again, with very similar indices. And so if you try and think, let's get more people like the top block, your problem is they look like the people in the bottom block. So it doesn't really suffice as a way of segmenting or differentiating your customers. In fact, it's a bit of a fail. And we often need more complex or more comprehensive techniques. 
And that's where machine learning comes in. Now I realize that some of you that are tuning in today might not be as familiar with machine learning methods as everybody else. So I just wanted to start with a quick definition. And this is one that I've used for a number of years now. And it focuses on the ability for computers to learn without explicitly training them. Now you're probably all thinking, I still don't understand what that means. So machine learning is where you feed a computer some data, some information on something that you've seen in the past, something that you know. You don't tell the machine to predict anything. You just say, here's the data, analyze it, find the patterns in it so that I can at some point in the future give you some new data so that you can take that model and make some predictions and projections on your new data. And there are three different types of machine learning methods. So we'll start with regression. Regression is often where I get into trouble, um, not because I don't understand it, but I get into trouble because I walk into places and call it school level mathematics and apparently you don't learn regressions in schools. Um, to be honest, as you can see with my three-year-old having learned to code within R, I kind of say regressions now nursery level mathematics. He's obviously a step above that. But in reality, regression is looking at predicting something that's got a continuous output. So when we say that, it could be anything from zero to infinity. So perhaps it could be the price somebody is willing to pay for a product. You could be willing to pay anything from zero up until infinity because you don't really know. You know, you get to infinity, I might not want to buy that product. But there's no money I would pay for it, for example. And that makes it really, really hard to build as a model because there's an infinite number of possibilities of predictions that you can make for a specific data point. So it means it's really hard to get something that's quite accurate. That's where the next step of model comes in. So it's what we call classification. This is where you have a discrete set of responses. So that might be which product a customer will purchase next out of your portfolio of eight to 10 products. The example that I like to use is imagine you're a corner shop and you've got limited space to put the biscuits on the shelves. Which biscuits should I stop? What are people most likely to buy? Is it the custard cream? Is it the bourbon? Is it the digestive? Or is it, in my opinion, the very underrated fig roll? goes very nicely with a cup of tea, milk in first. That's a debate for another day. Moving on to the model that we're looking at today is novelty or anomaly detection. And this is perhaps the simplest, and I use that word very lightly because machine learning itself isn't simple, but the simplest type of machine learning model. It's where you have one class. And that one class, if you think back to our RFE diagrams, is that people don't make a purchase. The most likely thing is people aren't gonna purchase right now. They're in that bottom block. And we are trying to use the machine learning model to predict a deviation from that class. So in this case, to predict a purchase, to find the purchases amongst the non-purchases. So that's all well and good, but what makes a good machine learning model? Well, perhaps the way to look at this or to tackle it is to try and quash some of the myths around machine learning. So let's have a look at a few of them. I go into clients quite often and they say, I couldn't possibly build a model like this because I've got a lot of blanks in my data. I've got a lot of missing information. It's not going to work. Now that's true if you're looking at old school standard statistical models. You really need quite complete, quite full data sets for the model be able to be able to build and predict effectively. With machine learning, it can handle blanks within the data. Imagine a row of data, you've got 10 attributes, but two of them are missing. A machine learning model would use the other eight that it does have to be able to make the prediction. It would just ignore the two missing values. Now, slight caveat, I'm not saying that if 90% of your data is blank or missing, you're going to be able to build the world's most top quality machine learning model. But machine learning can handle some blanks in data. So don't be afraid to try machine learning techniques if your data is a little bit gappy. Moving on to the next one, this is around history. And so some people will say to me, but I don't have three or four or five years worth of history. I couldn't possibly build a model that's going to work for me. And again, with some techniques that might be true, but if you think about it, every problem is different. And if I give you a couple of examples, I've built machine learning models for share trading before. Now share trading is a market that moves very, very quickly. And you probably only need three or four years worth of history to be able to determine the patterns within that market. Anything longer than that, you might be introducing patterns that are no longer there, and that might give you a model that doesn't give you an accurate reflection of current reality. The other example I like to use, going back to my love of gambling, 
I've tried to build machine learning models for Premier League football matches before. Now this is quite a foolish thing if you think about it, because if it was possible, bookmakers would be even richer than they are now. In fact, if it was possible to build those models, people like me would be able to build them and put the bookmakers out of business. But I'll give you a few insights from that, and I'm gonna take the Premier League, and I'm gonna use my favorite team for an example, not, not the team I support, I'm a big Liverpool fan, we can talk about that later as well, um, but my favorite example team for this model, which is Wolves. Now, I built a Premier League model and I used two seasons worth of history to predict the results. And actually, it was pretty good. And then I added a third year and the model got slightly worse. And so using Wolves as that example, if we go back three years, let's face it, and apologies to Wolves fans out there, Wolves sucked. I mean, they were destined for relegation. They were gonna go down, let's be honest. But if you have a look at the past two years, Wolves have improved, they've got a lot better. And so by building a model based on just the two years worth of data, you'll get a much more accurate reflection or prediction of how Wolves are going to do now than if you included three years worth of history, which has some of their you know, more tainted and tarnished history inside it. The next myth I want to talk about is variable selection. Now your CRM might have 200 pieces of information, 200 attributes on each customer. And you might think, well, where do I start? What am I gonna put into the model? And with machine learning, you don't have to spend time carefully choosing the 10 or 20 variables that are most important. Put it all in, because machine learning will ignore the variables that don't have any predictive quality. And sure, later on in time, you can start experimenting and saying, does this variable do anything? Let me drop it in and out. But at the start, when you're trying to get a model off the ground, that's the last thing that you want to be doing. Put it all in, see how the model works, and you can experiment later on in time. Now, it wouldn't be a data talk if we didn't discuss GDPR, so let's just quash a little myth about that. You can see I've made it in a nice, beautiful shade of blue, so it's not in the black slides that you've seen previously, just to give it a little bit more importance. Um, I will start by saying that I am not here to provide legal advice when it comes to GDPR, but what I can tell you is that machine learning can be GDPR safe. If you're working with customer data sets of customers or people that have opted in to you using their data for marketing purposes, machine learning is just another piece of analysis. And it's a piece of analysis that helps you target those customers much more effectively. So again, please don't come to me with any legal questions in several weeks time saying I've used machine learning, I'm not sure if it's the right thing to do, but machine learning can be GDPR safe if you make sure your data is opted in. So great, we've crossed a few myths. We know what makes a good model. We can build it. This is almost the most exciting bit as any data scientist. You want to get your hands dirty. You want to build a model. I am gonna have to just bring you back down to earth for a second because we've got to pre-process the data. We've got to prepare it for modeling. Now in the old days, a lot of people might have used this green Microsoft thing that began with the letter E. Um, Nowadays, we're building a model in R, so why don't we do the pre-processing in R as well? Because that means that if we want to update the model in several months' time, we can just change the data set and it can all pre-process within the same script. It saves a lot of time and energy. It's the future. Get out of Excel if you're still using it. R is where you need to be. And don't think about anything snaky beginning with the letter P. Very, very bad. Won't talk about that today. But here are some of the packages that I like to use for pre-processing. Now, this isn't all of the packages I use, and it's by no means all of the packages anybody can use. It's just the selection. Other packages are, of course, available. But you'll end up using, at some point, if you're pre-processing data in R, the Tidyverse. As you can see, my three-year-old's already got well-tuned into that one and knows exactly what to do when it comes to Tidyverse packages and commands. You'll probably use it in conjunction or you'll use data table at some point. The two of them work really well together. Lubridate for dealing with date values and date variables. Scales, particularly if you're working with percentages. And then if you want to get out of this horrible spreadsheet habit, you will need to read them in. There are various Excel packages available. Pick the one that works best for you. Excel Connect has never failed me yet, so that's the one that I tend to stick to. Boring pre-processing out of the way, we can now start thinking about building models. Now again, there's lots of different machine learning packages out there. I'm not gonna stand here today and evaluate them. Kernel Lab was something that worked well for me when I first started looking at this, so I've tended to stick to it for a lot of the machine learning problems that I deal with. Other packages are, of course, available. Before we model it, we need to split our data into training and testing sets. 
So a training set is the information that we are feeding the model for it to be able to determine the patterns. And we feed it two types of information in this case. The first set of information is people that have purchased very recently, so purchases, because we want the model to detect or to build up knowledge of what a purchase pattern looks like. And then on the flip side, we feed it some examples of non-purchases so that it can build up the patterns of what a non-purchase looks like. We can then use that to be able to define a model. And within those training and testing sets, we'll have variables from our CRMs and we'll have some parameters that we'll need to set. And I'll talk to you about that in a moment. Once we've got a model, we can make predictions and then constantly over time, we'll need to refine that model. So in the ideal world, the first model that we build will always be the best. In the real world, we have to build about 50 to 100 different models to be able to determine which one fits our data best. And that's by experimenting with parameters, different training sets, etc., etc. I know what you're all thinking, though. And you're thinking back to that RFE cube where I've got so many examples of non-purchases and not very many examples of purchases. And if I feed all those into the training set, it's going to be a little bit unbalanced. And yes, this is really look a little bit like this when I'm working with CRM databases, machine learning problems, end up ripping out a little bit of hair. It's not really a very enjoyable experience at the start. And that's why you have to have to do something that we call boosting. So boosting in this sense is trying to balance out the proportion of purchases to non-purchases within your model. Let's say you've got 10,000 examples of customers that have purchased historically and you've got 100,000 examples of, of customers that have not purchased historically. You know, you're at the point where over 90% of your data is non-purchases. Now, if I was a machine learning model, what I would do is say, well, hang on a minute, if 90% of the people don't purchase, I'm just gonna say everybody's not gonna purchase. I'll be right 90% of the time. I'm a lazy model. Models are a bit like us humans, you know, they're quite lazy. I'm a lazy model. Why should I bother doing anything else? So if we rebalance that and take a random sample of say 20 or 30,000 of the non-purchases, it balances out that training set a bit more. And it means that the model is going to be a lot better at detecting the patterns of purchase versus non-purchase. And it will go from a bit like looking for a needle in the haystack to really bad analogy, bringing all the needles out in front of you. But it does, as I say, or as I said before, it does mean we need to run through many, many iterations of the model. The first model that we build won't always be the best. So parameters, what parameters do we need to set in R to be able to make this model work? Well, we need to set up the kernel itself. I'll talk a little bit about kernels in the coming slides, but there are two types of kernel we can use. So you've got linear, which is a straight line relationship kernel. So for straight line data relationships, Sadly, no data set that we really ever deal with is that simple. So we need more complex kernels, like the Gaussian kernel that we have here, or so the everyday kernel, as I call it, or the radial basis kernel as the package within R calls it, the kernel package. Then you've got to set the type of model. So you remember before I spoke about regression, classification, and novelty detection. You need to set that up within your model. You then need to set a cost or a complexity parameter. So that's a number. High numbers, high costs means that you've got a model that's going to take a lot longer to build, but it's a lot less likely to misclassify points. It will have a much lower error rate. On the flip side, you can have a lower cost parameter. That means that the model will build a lot quicker, but may misclassify a few more points. So you have to work through that trade-off yourself. The final thing that you'll set is the type of output you want. And there's two types of output here. So you've got a standard response, which is literally a prediction purchase or non-purchase. And then you've got a probability prediction. So rather than just giving you the standard response, it will say, I think this person is likely to purchase and I attach a certainty of 70% to that prediction. Or I think this person is not likely to purchase and I attach a certainty of 80% to that prediction. Let's talk a little bit about kernels and let's just bring this back down to a really, really simple example. Let's imagine, let's just all close our eyes and imagine that our CRMs only had two attributes on. There are only two things that we can ever know about our customers and these are they. Nice, simple CRM database, no complexity. And that's the age of the customer and how much they paid for their last purchase. And when you plot them on a diagram like this, all the points kind of get, you know, almost congealed together. They're all sitting almost one on top of the other. They're very, very close. And it's difficult to segment them or to separate them into two groups. 
and this is where you need a function to do it. That function is a kernel. And what the kernel will do is it will apply a mathematical mapping in what they call higher dimensional feature space, the unicorn space as I like to call it, it's something you never see. And it will split your data set out into groups like this. So you've still got your blue points at the bottom. These are people that we think will not purchase. But now we've got red points that it's separated into the top of that feature space and says, you know what, these are the customers I think are gonna be really interesting to you over the next month. These are the people that you need to target. It's not actually changing the point. So if you go back to your original diagram, it's just providing a mapping so that it can pick out the purchases from all of the data that you've got in front of you. So if you put them on there, you can now see that the kernel has picked out these red points as the points of interest and as the points that we might want to look at for a media targeting strategy going forward. So what do the outputs look like? We've got a model, we've processed the data, we've built something that's amazing with a beautiful kernel that's mapped all the information. And now we get something like this. So if you have a look at the table on the left hand side, you've got your customer ID, a nice anonymized random number there for you. But then you've got two probabilities. You've got prob zero, which is the probability of not purchasing and prob one, which is the probability of purchasing. And it's just giving you that output, nice, simple, the two probabilities linked back to your customer. And you can then use those probabilities to split your customers into segmented or targeting blocks, if you like. And as an example, if you say that anybody with a probability of purchasing of 0.7 or higher, they're the people you might be really interested in. Go get them now, target them now, target them yesterday if you can really. You've then got that group that's a little bit below it, so a probability of purchasing of somewhere between 0.5 and 0.7, high likelihood you definitely want to be talking to them now, trying to persuade them to purchase. And then as you go further down, medium likelihood, potentially don't talk to them right now, but talk to them over the next week or two. And then at the bottom, these kind of models, they have a point where they, they almost reach saturation. So at some point, you'll get a lot of probabilities that are within about 1% of each other. And that's where the model kind of says, whoa, guess what? I've had enough here. I can't classify this anymore. I can't do any more. Now, we're not saying that low customers are not interesting at all. We're saying they're not interesting for now. It may well be that when you run the model again in three months, new patterns have emerged that makes those interesting now. So don't discount them or exclude them forever. Just don't worry too much about them now. And just applying it to a real life example, so this is one I've got from a few years ago, working with a UK hotel chain who had a customer database size of roughly 600,000 people and about 5% of those booked each month. And they came to me and said, look, I've got a load of people in my lowest RFE block. I've got a low recency, low frequency database. How can I persuade some of these people to rebook? How can I gain revenue from people that are just sitting on my database doing nothing? And we built a machine learning model, and as you can see, I've got a results chart here on the right hand side. And that black line that you see across the chart, that represents the 5%, the standard booking rate. And if you have a look at our very high, high and medium probability blocks from the machine learning model, they vastly outperform that 5% booking rate. Now, it wouldn't be a fair test if we didn't tell them to target some people in the lower block as well to prove that they were less likely to rebook. And as you can see that low block, it's almost half the booking rate, half that 5%, so around two and a half percent, which means that they truly were much lower propensity in terms of booking. And in fact, this was so successful that the amount of revenue that they regained within the first year of using this was in the region of five million pounds. Enough to spark fireworks. And to be honest, I can't really say anything else after ending with a stat like that. So. Normally, this is where I'd open the floor to questions. Feel free to put some comments in. I'll have a look at them. Very happy for you to connect with me on LinkedIn as well. If you are connecting, please just put a one liner in there saying you saw the talk, you wanted to chat further about it. I do get a lot of invites and I don't always respond to all of them. So please do just put that little one liner in there. I really hope to see you once we all can a face to face meetup for Brighton Art very, very soon. Do come, as I say, to join our meetup page. If I don't see you there, potentially at another Silicon Brighton event. For now, thank you so much for your attention this afternoon. And please, everybody, stay home and stay safe and protect our wonderful NHS. Thank you very much.